Okay, people, we don't have very much time. I want to give people the opportunity to have a word, to ask a question. Um, let's be really disciplined and really slick and well organized. There's a couple of microphones. And please uh, keep your questions and comments short and sharp and articulate. Yes. Thank you for a fascinating uh, panel. My question is both to David and to Philip. The Hamas Charter says everything about genocide. They're very explicit about it. They quote uh, Islamic Hadith, which says specifically, kill the Jews. And yet nobody ever seems to talk about that. I never ever see any mention of the Hamas Charter. And Article 7 says, kill the Jews. Thank you. But I'm going to take a few questions and comments and come back to people. Yes, please. Uh, Heidi. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask anyone who wants to answer it, but you talked a lot about the state protecting Jews, and we've seen quite a lot of failures in that sense lately with the Met Police and with a judge who just um, gave a very lenient sentence for Hamas supporters. So what are your thoughts on how we improve those, the leaks in the system, if you want to call them that. Who's on this side? Is it a possibility that we've become so fearful and that we're asking for help? We've lost the wit to reply. We've lost the fight. We've excluded ourselves. There's some amazing, um, <coughs> rape is not, I'm sorry, I'm so upset about it. All. Rape is, is not, <laughs> yeah, yes, resistance. And that was, corralled away in front of the BBC, and people were not seeing it. It was just Jews among Jews. I really feel very sad when I see I'm just among Jews, because in a sense of the word, in my lifetime, Jews were among Jews, and they weren't going to the seaside this time, they were going on the railway. So this worries me. I feel that we must be brave. We, we've, we need to arm ourselves. We need to be able to argue these points. And we have got people that would be turned, that people who are against us were idealists, like I was against apartheid and all these things. They're, mis they're misguided, and I think some of them can be turned, but we need to talk to them, and we need to be a presence and not hide behind other people Thank doing you. this. We've, loose, we've lost our, our strength, we've lost our wit, i lost our imagination, and we are discounting ourselves. So I want to say that the bravery with wisdom and experience, and I think we have to do our own thing, you know. Thank you. Right at the back there. Yes. Thank you so much. May I pick up, um, David, on your hesitation and pushing back against the, the modern blood libels and perhaps recall uh, the late, great uh, Jonathan Sachs's uh, analysis on the evolution, evolution of anti-Semitism, the mutating virus, the incredible analysis we had earlier on international law and how, in fact, it is perhaps being uh, abused and misused in order to promote anti-Semitism um, and ask the panel if the ancient blood libels uh, were perhaps as, I think the words you used, David, were well-entrenched, reasonable, responsible body of opinion, whether the ancient blood libels were in fact as widely believed as the, most, as the modern blood libels are, and whether in those circumstances we have an absolute responsibility to robustly push back against those lies, that misinformation, is especially where it uh, uses and abuses international law for that purpose. Yeah, thank you. Right next to you there. A uh, question for Deborah. Um, uh, so much of this comes from <clears throat> uh, the left and critical race theory. Do you think there's any hope in the United States that there is a pushback and a backlash against what is going on in academic institutions there? Hello. Um, there was a disparaging comment about populism uh, early on. I'm not certain what, what that um, means uh, because in the end, uh, the best defense against all forms of prejudice is a pluralistic society with democracy and freedom of speech. And uh, populism seems to embody that these days. Uh, decreasingly, uh, the word liberalism doesn't. Um, Judy, on the, just there, that's right. Stop, yes, thank you. 
Thank you, everybody. We've heard remarkably little about Israel and the Palestinians, and I wonder whether we've made a strategic mistake over the years, this has been going on a long, long time, in that we've allowed the Palestinians to become the cuddly victims of the world, and therefore anybody who attacks them it must be the baddie. And, and Israel does the same in saying that it's fighting Hamas, not the people of Gaza. And while to some extent that is true, the people of Gaza elected Hamas, and we see overwhelmingly they support Hamas, and they get involved and encourage all their children to get involved. And therefore, if we allow the Palestinians to be the nice people who happen to have a nasty Hamas stuck within them, then every time a Palestinian gets killed or hurt, it's those nasty Jews. Whereas if we, I mean, we didn't do that with the Nazis. We hated the Nazis and we attacked the Nazis, but we saw that it was Germany that was fighting the UK, not the Nazis. Uh, and therefore, we didn't feel guilty about any Germans being killed. So have we actually taken a strategic wrong path in this? Because the Palestinians have become the cuddly, cuddly people of all the, all the charities, all the organizations, all the NPs and so on. Yes, please. Uh, so a specific question to, to Deborah. While you were talking, Deborah, the Prime Minister's put out a statement. Uh, he talks about the protest being hijacked by extremists, um, glorifying terrorism, um, talks about the anti-Semitic tropes which were beamed onto the side of Parliament, um, and explosion of anti-Semitism post 7th of October. In your conversations with British um, politicians, that's talk by the Prime Minister, which is welcome, but what action do you think the state can take and is taking the British state? I'm going to take two more. One at the back, please. On the right, no? Yeah. At the back, yeah. Uh, this is just a comment, but thank you very much for your uh, presentations. Um, what I don't understand is how we let the Arab world... Uh, sees the narrative about Israel. Uh, ever since the end of the War of Independence, the Arab world has defined the conflict. They lose war after war after war, yet they define the conflict. And I think we're seeing part of the culmination of that, where the Palestinians all of a sudden are the new Jews. Um, and I just, I find the whole thing abhorrent, and I think the, the the, uh, the genesis, if you will, of this is that we have allowed them to co-opt the narrative. Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Um, my question is for whoever wants to take this on the panel, but Ulf, you alluded to this, and Deborah, I'm sure you encounter this in your work. So in the absence of a universally applicable, accepted, enforceable definition of anti-Semitism, how do we defend not just on char not, how do we defend against not just charges on the scale of genocide and Holocaust denial, but those maybe smaller, um, more elusive gray areas of anti-Semitism, like exclusion, which we face more and more of every day. Personally, I'm an Israeli citizen. This is something I've been facing in this country since 2021 and earlier. How do we defend against this as it continues to, to grow and rise? Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to take one more very quick one because my colleague from Goldsmiths is just there, uh, up the stairs a little, and to your right. Yes. Thank you. You'll be pleased. It's a short question. It just picks up on the critical race theory and university questions, and it's for Deborah. Um, whether you have any good examples of really excellent practice going on in universities that combats anti-Semitism and helps to deal with the issues we're all facing. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, I'm going to come to the panel. I'm going to ask the panel to limit themselves to literally two minutes each. Um, and then we're going to go to Deborah nice. oh, also. Uh, Rosa. So I'm going to limit myself to two points. The first is that we are all here united against anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism started long before Israel. It started long before possibly the church, as Deborah said. I don't think that we're here to express opinions on what's going on in Gaza today, which is a catastrophe, or what's going on in Israel today, which is also a catastrophe. And certainly, we're not here to point fingers at Arabs or at anyone else in terms of that conflict. So I just want to make that clear and on record. <laughs> the second thing to say, and it answers a number of points, is the 
I learned from my feminist forebears that you have to name a problem, you have to define the problem before you address the problem, whether that's sexual harassment or anything else. We have to name and define anti-Semitism in law and not in politics. I know the hard work Ahmed's done and Deborah's done on IRA. IRA doesn't go far enough. We have to be able to define it in law, to protect it in law, and that is what we all need to come together to do globally and nationally. Thank you. Thank you, Rosa. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, who Fletcher? Yeah, um, I have loads of things to say, but I'm going to yield my time because I don't think my topic speaks specifically to the questions that have been asked, but you can come and ask me other questions later. Philip. Bravo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for the questions, which are very important, all of them. Um, I just want to make four quick points. One is about the Hamas Charter, which was asked. Um, I've had to listen to people tell me, oh, well, the Hamas Charter was written a while ago, they changed their mind about it, and so forth. If nothing else, October the 7th proves that the Hamas Charter means a lot to them. Secondly, on failures of the state, yes, it's true. The state has been weak in certain areas. Institutions have been very weak in certain areas. So that's a fight we have to have inside the state, inside those institutions. We can't walk away from them. The area that I work in, as David does, although thankfully I'm retired, I do not know if I could go to work in a university in this country today and feel safe. What David especially has to put up with is revolting and abhorrent, and he needs all the support we have. <laughs> But we can't walk away from it. We cannot walk away from it, and we have to hold fast. This is what I was trying to say at the end. We have to hold fast to our values and our beliefs. Our belief in reason and logic and evidence and decency, actually, something I didn't mention. Thirdly, and this is related to it, we are not on our own. It feels like we are, on our, we are on our own, and we have been betrayed, not simply abandoned, betrayed by people in a way that is unforgivable. And I mean that personally too. I feel that myself from long-standing friends and associates. And I'm horrified and shocked. But it's not the first time this has happened. But there are nevertheless people outside the Jewish community who do offer us support. And I have very dear friends, and in my family too, who are not Jewish, who have given me not only support, but encouraged me and made me more confident than I would otherwise have been. And I don't think I am alone in saying that. Very quickly, and Philip. Lastly, on the question of the blood libel and its roots. I think a very important thing to understand about anti-Semitism is that it gets reworked all the time. It gets re-articulated in different frames of reference. Right? And so it is the old idea, but it is in a new form and a new shape within a new discourse structure. So anti-Semitism is not invariant. It's not the same thing all the time. It takes different forms and different shapes and it waxes and it wanes. Unfortunately, we're now in a period where it is waxing. Thank you. <laughs> oh, was the, was the problem Germany or was the problem Nazis? I, I don't think I'm the right person to answer that yes. kind of question. <clears throat> I'd, I'd like to pick up a thought that Philip brought up that the Hamas Charter wasn't taken seriously by many in the Western world who have been reading it. And there's a history because when Philip said that, immediately it came to, to my mind that, well, Mein Kampf wasn't taken seriously either. And the bad guy did announce what he wanted to do. And it's a phenomenon that we can watch in further respects. What Putin writes doesn't get taken seriously either. And we see in Ukraine what it means. We see in Syria what it means. We see in Africa what it means. And we see how now that 
Putin is no longer as strong as he uh, used to be and needs to rely on Iran for uh, military capabilities, how that has facilitated Iran's power brokering in the Middle East, of which maybe 7 October is an element because Iran trained Hamas as one of its proxies to unleash Iranian mullah anti-Semitism through Hamas anti-Semitism on the state of Israel. So how do we protect Jews against the effects of the loopholes in the legal system? How do we address the fact that Palestinians have managed to uh, portray themselves as the quintessentially self-defined victims who are nice people at the same time? How do we deal with the fact that the Arab world was able to seize the narrative about the conflict? A, a German scholar has argued by sheer numbers, if you have 15 ambassadors coming to your foreign office with the same narrative, and there's one Israeli ambassador, the sheer numbers seem to make a difference. A German scholar has researched that in relation to the German foreign office. And how do we handle the situation that there is not yet a definition? Um, first and foremost, it was mentioned in a statement from the audience, democratic discourse really matters. But democratic discourse only yields the results uh, involving opinions that were actually articulated. This means that, for instance, in my capacity as the editor-in-chief of the German Military Law Review, one of the first things I did after 7 October, I found a colleague who was writing about the legal framework applicable to the Operation Swords of Iron, and I knew that this colleague would write the right legal assessment, and I, I was really thrilled when I read his analysis, which is now uh, in print, um, and uh, Rosa has uh, received an advanced copy so she can hopefully confirm um, what, what I just said in, in terms of the quality of this, this piece. Next thing is that obviously we need to get something into the statute book. Since laws can have like two types of roots, one being society, the other one being political leadership, for as long as the democratic discourse in society doesn't create that trend strongly enough, it's a matter of political leadership. Political leaders need to understand that there is a challenge and that they have to address this challenge. And panels like this one, where the various facets of the challenge are being discussed, can help political decision makers to be more educated in what they actually need to tackle. And I think I rest my case at this point and hand Absolutely. over. Okay. I am, wait, wait. Can, can I just, uh, I'm going to be very brief because I have a plane to catch and I'm going to be out of here. I'm not going to say hello to anyone. So please don't tell me you met me 12 years ago. I'm sorry. I won't be able to renew the relationship. Um, first of all, uh, there, and I'm going to answer just, there are a whole lot of things, but uh, I think that one of the things to think of is anti-Semitism as a virus. We saw it with the COVID. First there was one strain, then there's another strain, it adapts, it, it, it mutates, it's able to adapt. It doesn't adapt to a healthy body. There has to be an unhealthiness in the body for it to adapt, so it's not an exact uh, analogy, but think of it in that adaptability. Um, a number of you have talked about uh, feeling alone and the failure. Um, look, we saw it with the, the gender-based violence. I had an, uh, gender-based violence is an antiseptic way of talking about rape and mutilation of, of uh, women, nails and vagina, horrible stuff, horrible, horrible, horrible. Um, and what was striking to me was the silence of uh, the, so many people, but particularly the human rights community and the left community. It's bad for anyone to remain silent in the face of that. It's utterly hypocritical for those groups to remain silent, and that has been... Um, and the only... 
The only difference, you know, in their response to Boko Haram, to the Yazidi women who were horrifically treated, um, and even the Iranian women with the, taking off their head covers, the only difference here, you know, we need evidence, we need, have we heard from the rapists, have we seen films of the rape, whatever, whatever, uh, is that these were perceived to be Jews. They weren't all Jews. Some were Muslims, some were Druze, some were foreign workers, etc. cetera. Um, the, the point I want to, in terms of uh, campuses responding uh, and governments responding, I'm going to meld those two together. And I'm going to say, even though we may feel we're on our own, and maybe to end with a, a somewhat positive note, um, even though we feel our own, this is not the 1930s. You just, you just read me the prime, the prime minister's statement. Uh, my president has utterly condemned this. He's condemned this to me when I've spoken to him privately. He's more importantly, he's condemned it publicly. Uh, our vice president, our secretary of state, other countries. You have many, many countries that have appointed special envoys, such as myself, in the same position to fight anti-Semitism. You have countries that have done um, studies of this. It's it's frightening. It's different from what we've ever seen, hmm. but it's very. It's not 19. It's not even 1933. It might be 1926. But it's not, no, no, I mean, that's, that's you know, democratic Germany, a Weimar Germany. Mm -hmm. But it's not the 1930s, and I think that's, that you have to be very conscious of that. With thank you, and I bid you farewell. All right. Thank you, Deborah. Deborah has a flight to catch. Thank you all. I, <laughs> I want to uh, thank very much our hosts at uh, Westminster University. And very often that would be a kind of formal, perfunctory, polite thank you. But this is not a normal, perfunctory, polite thank you. Because as an academic centre and as academics, we live and operate in a hostile environment. And it is really difficult for us to find spaces in universities, physical spaces and scholarly spaces in which we can do our work. And that is the context in which I would like to thank the University of Westminster. And I would like to uh, introduce to you uh, Dibesh Anand, Dibesh Anand, who is the Deputy Vice-Chancellor here, who would like to say a word. Thank you very, very much. Uh, thank you, David. Now, I know I, it is important. I'm not a very polite person. I'm not also a very politically sophisticated person, but I do believe in saying few things. For any university, as you pointed out, starting with academic freedom, it should be obvious that we have to host events like these. I mean, there should be no problem, there should be no controversy, there should be no sensitivity. Of course, we do it sensitive, we do it care, but that's a natural thing we do. Most universities here in the UK, including our own university, we have had several events on various issues, even including recent months connected to Israel and Palestine. And the point is, the university has to space for all. And that's the promise that all universities make, including ours. But what we can say to you that the promise we are making is, well, let's say, the words we put forward is what we practice. And I just wish more universities did that. So when they say that we want to be a space for everyone, whether you can bring your whole self to work and study, which is also our motto, and we try our level best. We don't always get it right. That might not be the live regrets of all, let's say, in this case, Jewish students and colleagues, but we're working towards that. I just wanted to, uh, first, that's the promise to making to all of you that give us more opportunities, let's work together. Second, when we approached about the event, I know we were seen as largely a venue provider. And for me, again, we had a discussion, should we do it, not, not, and why not, is the question. And I took responsibility personally because not only I'm Deputy Vice Chancellor, I'm a professor of politics and international relations. I've worked on China, I've worked on Tibet, I've worked on Islamophobia, I've worked on Kashmir, I've worked on all these issues. And when people said, oh, we need to be balanced, 
I've hosted the Dalai Lama. Now, I can't get Chinese embassy to sit next to the Dalai Lama when I'm doing an event. It's obvious. I've hosted Chinese embassy officials. I would not get the Dalai Lama to sit next to them. So the whole idea of balancing, and you can imagine that when we do events like this, there's a pressure sometimes we need to balance. For me, when we talk of prejudices, when we talk of hatred, and we have worked, and my own work, apart from the things I mentioned, has been on working towards an anti-racist university. When we do things around, let's say, Black Lives Matter movement, I'm not going to get a white racist to sit next to see give a, diff a different viewpoint. That is not acceptable. So when we are talking anti, uh, let's say, when I'm talking of Islamophobia, I'm not going to invite an Islamophobe to then say or oh, give give a balanced viewpoint. I don't want to say impolite word here, but I will never do it. So when we do events on anti-Semitism, I see no reason why need to have, we have different viewpoints to balance anything. That's Again, so we have to be unapologetic about supporting challenge of anti-Semitism. The, the third thing is about, we adopted IHR a couple of years ago. I was part of it in terms of not being a deputy vice chair, but I was an elected staff governor. It came to the court. I was one of the members of working group. It was a learning experience for me. My instinct was not immediately to go for it. But at the same time, when I spent six, seven months, I realized that what was driven by was not what I believe in. That's not important. What I found that many, not all, but many Jewish colleagues and students did, that to hide their identity often. For me, that is not acceptable. For me, IHRA definition, again, was more than, not only for me, by the way, for my university. We are, might be one of the few ones which did not only adopt because it was the pressure of the government. If it was, I would have said, whatever, off to the government. I don't care what the government says. It was about a process of culture change. It's not enough to adopt these definitions, but something to do within the community, and we've been trying that for the last two years, to do within the community in order to use the definition to bring about culture change where it's no longer acceptable that certain people with certain identity hide themselves. That's fourth, third point. And one final point, and I'm taking a lot, but it's one, Deborah is gone, so we don't have that much rush. And anyway, tea, coffee is gone. So one final thing. Once I started working on this, I'm not a Jewish person. I have no connection to being a Jewish person at all in my personal life. So it's not personally connected in that sense. But I do strongly believe in justice. I strongly believe in fairness and fighting against all forms of prejudices. When I started this work of supporting IHR definition, culture change, and going beyond that, getting John Mann, John Mann, many of you might know, we had a discussion in the parliament. I'll not name the universities. By the way, you might be from the similar universities. Almost university representatives, some of them, particularly from two very large institutions, including the one you might have gone to, right? I mean, gone to, not you gone to, but you might have approached for this event. Their approach was, we are so great. We are doing all fine. And for me, it was almost like an arrogant behavior by university that we are doing great. And my only thing was, I don't think anyone is getting it right. Can we learn from each other on how to get it better? And this is what I would say, that university should not be cautious, but should do more. Questions I get, who is behind it? And this is something I've never found. I've worked on every issue I've given to you example of. Sometimes I get trolled, et cetera, or on social media as a common thing, especially by Hindu right-wing trolls in India, where I come from. But what I got was, when I was in Israel last year, I did a post a picture from Hebrew University Jerusalem, discussions there, which tells you that I'm not against anti, I'm anti BDS, that should give my politics, but anyway, do it. Uh, who's sponsoring you? Now, I'm a professor, a senior professor. I mean, I'm not rich. No, I'm on my own. I have no responsibility family one. So I can clearly afford to go to Israel if I want to. But <laughs> what I say is that when I made comments, this is from certain people who started questioning, who is behind this? Who's sponsoring you? Who's funding you? So all my work on IHRA, on culture change, on anti-Semitism, which is driven by me and by my university value, and I'm fully supported by others in my university, right? So it's not only me. There's always a sense of there's a hidden hand behind that. That brings us back to the problem we are talking about here. That it's not my agency as an anti-racist that's respected. There's always an assumption that because I'm want to, I am senior, I want to be senior. I'm already senior. I will be vice chancellor <laughs> one day, I guess. But is that there has to be a hidden hand, a powerful hand, an invisible one, and a nasty one, one with money behind it. For me, the more I get it, the more I'm determined that both personally and as a university, we will make sure that we will not, let's say, cower in the face of bullies or in face of you know, other anti-Semitic pressure that we'll fight on. Finally, 
none of this would have been possible. I know I, the London Center, you all are important and you did it. And I go, thank you for that, panelists. But the people I want to just thank because very last minute, Thursday evening, we decided the venue. And I had, and it's Sunday. It's not easy. But I have Ingrid there, Edgar there, Theo here, Sam here, Joshua here. Other than Joshua, I know because he's a JSOC president and we work very closely together. All of them are non Jewish. They did not think twice and they came for it. So thank you, everyone. And thank you. And let's partner together and fight against anti Semitism always. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, and I can, see, I can see that people are hungry for their Sunday lunch. I would just leave you with one answer to a question, which is that we don't defend Jews against anti-Semitism because Jews are good or because any other nation or religion or class or gender is bad. We fight anti-Semitism because we fight a certain way of thinking about the world and we fight in favour of the democratic state. And that means that we side with democratic Germans against Nazism and with democratic Palestinians against uh, Hamas and with democratic Muslims against uh, uh, fundamentalism and with democratic Jews against those who are not so democratic and against those who are like some of the people in the current Israeli government, uh, racist. So it's a fight to unite people who defend democratic thinking and democratic states across the world. Thank you very, very much.